The War of 1812. It's sometimes called the Second American Revolution because it was fought over promises made but not kept by the British at the end of the Revolutionary War. It was an especially vicious war, for Great Britain had been humiliated by their first defeat at the hands of what they considered a fledgling nation. And now, determined not to have a second embarrassment, in the War of 1812, they set out to deliver a convincing message of their military superiority. By August of 1814, the British had entered Washington, D.C., routed the American troops, they chased President and Mrs. Madison from the city, and then they burned down the government buildings, including the White House and the U.S. Capitol building, the very symbolic center of the American nation. The British then headed for Baltimore, at that time the nation's third largest population center, to attack Fort McHenry, which was located on a peninsula guarding the city. That fort had been named for James McHenry, a military officer under Generals Washington and Lafayette during the Revolution. McHenry later became a signer of the U.S. Constitution and then the Secretary of War for Presidents George Washington and John Adams. The British understood that the destruction of Fort McHenry would be another demoralizing defeat for the Americans. Now, Major George Armistead, the commander of Fort McHenry, had arrived at his post a year earlier. He understood that at some point in the war, because of the strategic importance of that fort, that he would probably be attacked by the British. So in June of 1813, he had commissioned Mary Pickersgill, a widow who made flags for ships, to make two flags for the fort. The smaller flag, which was still a very large 25 feet long and 17 feet wide, was called a storm flag to be flown in inclement weather. The larger flag, which was the garrison flag, was an impressive 42 feet long and 30 feet wide. Armistead had wanted that flag to be so large that it would be impossible for the British to miss it from a distance. He didn't want them to lose their way and miss the fort. So when the British approached a year later, in September of 1814, they first attempted to take the fort by land, but that assault was resoundingly repulsed by the tenacious Americans. Sixteen British warships then positioned themselves in the harbor around the exposed fort to begin a devastating bombardment and force its surrender. However, at the same time that military preparations were being made for this massive assault, a relatively small and otherwise insignificant humanitarian effort was simultaneously underway. As the British had marched from Washington, through Maryland, and on toward the fort, they had seized leading citizens along the way and carried them off as hostages, placing them as prisoners on board British warships. One of those hostages was a Dr. William Beans. Some of Bean's many friends prevailed on a young Baltimore attorney and on John C. Skinner, the U.S. government liaison agent, to approach the British and plead for Bean's freedom. The two men successfully negotiated his release, but since the British were about to launch their attack on the fort, all three were detained and placed on board a British ship to be released at the end of the battle. Early in the morning of September the 12th, 1814, the British launched their attack. It was rainy and wet, so the Americans were flying the smaller storm flag. The British, with their superior weaponry, placed their ships outside the range of the American guns, and then they launched a high trajectory projectile attack against the fort, hurling thousands of cannonballs and scores of rockets down upon the Americans in an unremitting hail of fire and hot shrapnel. Throughout that full day, during that night, and across the next day, the bombardment continued as Dr. Beans and his two friends watched helplessly. After dark, on the evening of the second day, the firing finally ceased. The silence was deafening, and the suspense was agonizing. Beans and his friends couldn't tell if the firing had stopped because the fort had fallen or because the British had given up. Rising well before dawn on the morning of the 14th, the three Americans pressed tightly against the railing of the ship, straining eagerly to see any indication of what might have befallen the fort. When they had last seen the fort the night before as darkness fell, the American flag had still been flying. But was it still flying? The young Baltimore attorney held a telescope tight against his eye, searching to see whether the American flag still flew or whether a British flag was now flying in its place. As he waited, he pulled a letter from his pocket and on the back of that envelope began to scribble an inspired poem voicing his thoughts about what he was experiencing at that very moment. 
He began that poem with a simple question that had tormented his own soul as he peered through the early morning darkness. Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilights at last night's last gleaming? Could anyone tell what had happened? Did anyone know the outcome? He soon saw the answer for himself. The fort had not surrendered. In fact, the Americans had taken down the smaller storm flag and raised the massive garrison flag, and it now waved proudly in the morning light atop the 90-foot flagpole, while the Americans inside the fort played Yankee Doodle and fired their guns in celebration. The Americans had taken the worst the British could give and had not been defeated. Just three months later, the British signed a peace treaty to end that war. But on that momentous morning, after the flag was seen waving in the breeze, the three Americans were finally released from the British ship. And on their way back to shore, Francis Scott Key continued to ponder what he had just experienced. Later, in his hotel room, he completed the poem, penning four full verses, the last of which summarized what patriotic Americans so strongly felt. Praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. His poem was soon printed, and it was sung, ironically, to the melody of a popular British tune. Known as the Star Spangled Banner, by the 1890s the military required that it be played at the raising and lowering of the flag. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson ordered it played at all military ceremonies, and on March 3, 1931, President Herbert Hoover signed a federal law making the Star Spangled Banner America's official national anthem. And today, that song and its words remain no less stirring to Americans than when it was first penned some two centuries ago.